last week we returned from a 17 days Europe trip where we explored three countries mainly in Central Europe and also took day trips to three other smaller countries. And probably one of the best decisions we made while planning out this entire trip was to rent a car and do a road trip. So that's what this video is going to be all about. Everything that you need to know about renting and driving a car in Europe. Now coming to the most important part of this video which is the real driving experience in Europe and I won't talk about it because I did not drive but it was my husband who drove in Europe so I'm going to hand it over to him and he'll tell you how was his experience driving around the different countries in Europe. So the one thing that most people are worried about when they go to Europe is uh, driving on the left hand side of the car uh, and that is something that I was also naturally concerned about. But when we started driving, when we picked up the car and uh, I took it out, I did not feel any, any problem uh, driving from the right hand side of the car. You actually get used to it pretty quickly. It's just a simple mental shift that, you know, instead of driving from the left side, you're driving on the right hand side. And when you see all other cars driving on that side of the road, you just uh, go with the flow. So that, in my opinion, is not as big a deal as most people think it would be. The place where I actually faced a problem was uh, driving within the city because in Europe people are very strict about their rules and uh, you'll see there's a you know considerable gap between any two cars. Uh, they follow all the rules very closely. They don't change lanes. When there's a traffic signal, they stop at the you know very right place. So for us Indians, it's we are not used to it. We change lanes whenever we want. We are free to do whatever we want here but in Europe you can't do that most of the times it's intuitive but for for example you can't just take a u-turn anywhere you have to find the right place where you can take a turn or probably take a couple of turns and then come back to where you want so these are the things that I struggled with if you have to get over it I would suggest firstly understand the rules of uh, driving in Europe uh, as closely as possible and once you do that I think it becomes considerably simpler but keep in mind that you know Europeans drive according to rules. Secondly, get an idea of the map of the place wherever you're going to drive. Just spend five to 10 minutes understanding that place, how you will get to that uh, particular point where you want to reach to. Uh, driving on the motorway, on the highways outside the city is very easy uh, in Europe. You will, you will find cars driving at 140, 150, 160 very regularly. Consider that you are driving straight and there are two lanes and there is a divider. So the ones driving on the left hand side are supposed to be driving faster than the ones in the right uh, in the right lane. So just keep in mind whenever there is an overtake uh, that's happening it has to happen from the left hand side and not from the right hand side. The right hand side is for the slower cars, the left hand side is for the faster cars. Otherwise it's a breeze to drive on European motorways. Even on regular highways when it's uh, not a four lane but a normal two lane. Uh, the traffic is not that much and it's uh, quite easy to drive. Just stick to your lane, keep driving. So one thing that you should take care of uh, before even choosing a car is the type of car uh, you must choose. So if you're used to driving an SUV, I would recommend that uh, uh, you either take a car that is as big as the SUV you drive or which is smaller than that because it helps in the maneuvering of the car. The second decision that you must take is whether you want to go with a manual transmission or an automatic transmission. I would highly recommend taking an automatic transmission car even in Europe uh, because you know why add another piece of complexity to the entire thing. I feel intuitively that even if you have to uh, change the gears with your right hand it might sometimes be confusing. I'm not 100% sure of that, but I would highly recommend you taking an auto, uh, automatic transmission if you want to make things uh, easier for yourself. Just one thing that I would like to add here is that the entire time that we drove around in Europe, not once did we hear a car honk. We did not honk and neither did we hear anybody else honking. So it was such a different experience and such a peaceful driving experience that we had. Now we have come to the last section of this video wherein I'll be telling you some important tips that we picked up during our driving experience in Europe. So the very first thing that we'll talk about is how to fill petrol in Europe and how to pay for it. 
Now in India, when you're going to any petrol uh, station, uh, you, there'll be a lot of people there who'll fill the petrol for you and you just give them cash or you give them your card and they do the transaction and you're done. But when you're driving in any international location, you have to fill the gas yourself. At least in Europe, we had to and even in New Zealand, we had to fill the petrol ourselves. The very first time that you'll go to a petrol station, it can be a little intimidating experience because A, you don't know how to fill petrol and B, you don't know how to pay for it or to whom do you have to pay because there won't be anybody around at the petrol station. But it's actually pretty simple and straightforward. So once you park your car in front of any of the filling station, uh, you'll see whether it's for petrol or diesel. So let's say if your car uh, needs petrol, you pick up the nozzle that says petrol and you open the petrol tank of your car and uh, you, there's a button on the nozzle that you press and you just start uh, filling in petrol in the car. So when you're traveling to any country outside India, you have to obviously fill the petrol tank on your own of your car. So we'll just show you how it's done. Right now we are leaving from Croatia for our next country and we are about to fill petrol in our uh, car. So we'll show you. So we have to take petrol, which is E5. Once you're done filling petrol in your car, how do you pay for it? This can be a little confusing if it's your first time because there will be nobody around there to take uh, money from you. Uh, but it's actually again pretty simple. So in all of these petrol stations, you will see there will be a small uh, shop, a small grocery shop. So now that we are done filling the petrol in the car, we are going to uh, go and make the payment. For that you have to see the counter number at which you filled uh, the petrol and you go inside the shop which is there at the petrol pump, tell them the number which is one here and they will give you the bill and you just make the payment by card or cash. So it's quite convenient actually. Now another interesting thing that we learned uh, in Europe was how to pay at the parking lots. Now parking in Europe, in most of the places in Europe is obviously not free. In fact it's quite expensive, you can expect to pay anywhere between 5 to 10 euros at a particular parking lot. But how do you actually pay for it? This is something that confused the hell out of us the very first time we parked at a par pro proper parking lot. But actually it's pretty simple. So all you have to do is when you're entering the parking lot, you have to cross a barrier. And for the barrier to open, there'll be a small machine there. You just press the button and a card comes out of it. So you take the card, you cross the barrier and you enter the parking lot and you just park your car. Now you're done with the sightseeing and you come back to the parking lot and you want to take out your car, but there is an exit barrier. How does that barrier open? That barrier opens when you pay for it. But how do you pay for it when there's nobody around to take money from you. Very near to the exit barrier, you will be able to locate a small machine which looks like an ATM machine basically. So you go to this machine and uh, you have to go with the card that you took out from the machine while entering the parking lot. Now in the machine you just put this, uh, there will be a slot for putting this uh, card. Once you enter the card, then it will show you what is the uh, amount that you have to pay for the parking. Now the best thing is you can either pay by cash or you can pay by card. So when you're paying by card, it's as simple as transacting uh, on an ATM machine. You put the card, you put your pin and then it's done. And in case if you're paying through cash, it, it's advisable to give the exact change. So for example, if you have to pay 6 euros, it's advisable to give exact 6 euro, euros in change. But I think you can also like pay 10 euros and you'll get back 4 euros. I haven't tried that, but I think it's possible. So once you do the payment, then you will get another card from the same machine, which basically it's it's a receipt that uh, you have paid uh, the amount for the parking uh, lot. So now you go back to your car, and uh, when you are uh, so, and when you reach the exit ramp, there will be another small machine. You put this second card inside the machine, and the barrier opens, and you're free to go. 
so it's pretty simple right now you'll find a few open parking spots where parking is free for a couple of hours or sometimes even 4 to 6 hours when you are parking your car at these spots you have to make sure that you display the time at which you parked your car in the front on the dashboard so here it said that the parking is free for 180 minutes and we had to put the the time tag This particular parking spot uh, had free parking only for 180 minutes and how do you keep track of time? So you'll have something uh, something like this in your rental car which uh, using which basically uh, you can uh, put the time, the time at which you parked your car. So let's say if you have parked at 3.30 like we did, we marked it at 3.30 and then we just put it in front on the dashboard so that it's visible from outside as well. Uh, if you don't do that and if in case somebody catches you then you might have to pay a fine and uh, that's what I have heard I don't know but then it's always advisable that at such parking lots you put this with, with the parking time and then come back in whatever the time was to make sure you don't have to pay for parking. Another important tip is regarding border crossing in your rental car. So we ended up crossing multiple borders during our stay there. For example, when we went to Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina and Slovenia. So all they check at these border control points is your passport and they'll also ask for your rental car papers. So you just hand over these documents to them while you, while you are in your car and they'll check these documents and they'll put a stamp on the passport. They might ask you one or two very basic questions like where are you coming from? How many days are you planning to be in this country? But that's it, it's a pretty smooth process and you just enter a new country. Most of the cars in Europe will have inbuilt GPS or navigation system but it's always advisable to have a downloaded offline maps on your phone as well. And we have seen that Google Maps works absolutely perfectly in Europe and in fact it worked perfectly well in New Zealand as well. So what we do is we always download an offline map of the entire area that we are visiting. So that way is when we lose coverage or uh, we go through some patches where there's no network, then, then even then our maps is work, working perfectly fine. So make sure you download an offline Google Maps of the area that you're going to visit. Also, when you're downloading Google Maps, make sure you also download some good songs on your phone so that you can listen to them while driving around in Europe. And most of the cars, they have Bluetooth uh, system, so you can connect your car directly through Bluetooth and you can play the songs that you want. Now, like I told you in the beginning of this video, that we ended up saving more than 10,000 rupees on rental cars just a week before our trip started. So how did we do that? So the very first time that we booked the rental cars for Europe was almost two months before our actual trip date because we had to apply for our Schengen visa and we had to show them proof of transportation within the various countries and uh, it was a completely refundable uh, booking that we had uh, done and at both the locations that is for Austria and for Croatia we had booked manual cars because the automatic cars were almost 3x times the cost of a manual car. Around a couple of weeks before our trip was about to begin I kept on uh, checking the updated prices on rentalcars.com and luckily just a week before the trip started we got amazing deals for both these locations. In Austria we got an automatic car at a much cheaper rate compared to the manual car that we had earlier booked. In fact it costed us around 11,000 rupees less. Uh, so we cancelled our first booking and made a fresh booking and even in Croatia we got an automatic car at the same price and in fact we got it for more number of days. So based on my personal experience I would definitely recommend that keep checking the rental car uh, website for dynamic pricing and you might get a better deal at the last moment. Now I'll just tell you how much roughly it costed us to do a road trip in Europe. So the rental car that we had booked, uh, it costed us around 450 euros. So we had rented two cars, one in Austria and one in Croatia. So it costed us 450 euros. And also uh, we had to pay a one-way uh, drop fee and also the border crossing fee because we went to different countries. So that costed us close to uh, 200 euros. And then we purchased insurance for our car uh, in Croatia that costed us around 100 euros. 
and uh, for fuel we paid close to 120 euros that was 120 euros for the entire time that we drove around in austria croatia and the other uh, countries uh, for parking we paid 40 euros like i told you parking is expensive in uh, europe apart from this we also had to pay some small amount at the toll whenever we used the motorway so that costed us around uh, 6 to 7 euros so in all the entire uh, cost of rental cars came up uh, came up to around 915 euros for us so that's it for this vlog i have tried compiling all the information that i had gathered during my research and putting all that information in the form of this one video i hope you all found it useful if you have any questions related to driving in europe then please feel free to drop them in the comment section and i'll definitely try and help you guys out and if you have any comments about how the video could have been better or if in case i have misstated any fact then please let me know as well and hope you guys enjoyed watching this video Thank you.